بسم الله إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفر ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مدل له ومن يدلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله We've been asked today to talk about Mauritania. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Amin Kathiran. A lot of the people have been asking us, what's up with Mauritania? How is it to live in a place like Mauritania? So, we want to explain to the people, living and studying in Mauritania is quite different than what it might be like living and studying in other countries. As far as Mauritania is concerned, the first thing you have to recognize is that you'll be studying in people's homes. So we saw fit to have these types of lectures in my home. You'll be studying while the children are playing, while you're studying with the sheikh, because you're on his personal time. And that's what life is similar to in Mauritania. But if I have to start I would like to say first that living in Mauritania is like going and camping out in a place that you've only seen on TV. For example, hey, you're just mine. For example, you've gone to places on a TV, I should say, and seen the Sahara Desert. That's Mauritania, for real, the real Sahara Desert. Sah <laughs> wa so in the Sahara, there is no time or room for veneer. What do we mean by veneer? Veneer is like this. Do they have this in the camera? Okay. Make a pitch. Get this in the picture slightly. Veneer is when you have this type of wood. Under it is cheap wood. You know, cheap wood. But on the top half inch they put another type of wood that makes it seem as though this whole thing is red wood or some real nice wood that's the example of someone who outwardly looks like he's a talib al -ilm, and inwardly he's just an American consumer and talib al -ilm al al -an has become a consumer type thing well, people want to buy everything, but they don't really want to have it on the deep insides of themselves, this action of being a talib al -ilm. Mauritania will eat you up and spit you out. Mauritania is a type of place that if you go to it, you have to be ready to live in the open desert, in a tent, get up early in the morning without any water to make wudu, or any water to make is stinja and make tayammu maybe weeks on the end and maybe you have to go where the camels go to get the water and drink from the same thing that the camels drink when they drink the water I'm not trying to be funny but that's the reality of Mauritania we studied usul al fiqh from a number of teachers one of the teachers that we studied it from only taught the class when he was feeding his camels okay now we feed the camels peanut butter blocks of peanut butter we break them up so if you want to get his attention you break up the, the peanut butter and feed the camels while he's studying with he's teaching somebody else and then when it's your turn that student will break up the the peanut butter and put it in a trough with water so the camels can all eat it and he has over a hundred camels okay so you all get the lesson but the camels are used to him so they're gonna eat and come and they wanna get petted by him and they wanna lean towards him and they start wiving their faces like this with all the water in their lips and it starts flowing over your paper and on your hair and on your face those people who like designer khimars and they like the nice um, the, the, the thobes that the men be wearing the fiddha or the different names of the ones that they be having you're not gonna like Mauritania because Mauritania doesn't care how much your, your thobe costs, it care, you know, if it's properly worn and if it's sensible, period. That's the only thing. And can you do the work? That's it. So a typical day in Mauritania is the sheikh will start off his lessons by teaching his children. 
He'll start off by teaching his family members. And if you get to the point where he respects you and allows you to sit in the lessons where he's teaching his children, you should be quiet and don't ask any questions and just pay attention because you're a guest in someone's home or in someone's tent. So they didn't touch this? Anyway. So you sit there and you take it all in. And then when you get the opportunity for your class, you can then ask, well, I was sitting there and you said such and such and so and so to your son or to your nephew or to your cousin. What does that mean? Blah, 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 blah. And he'll go through it with you in that manner. Someone who wants to travel to Mauritania, I would suggest to them not to unless they had already learned how to speak fluent Arabic. If you can speak fluent Arabic, Tadadin, Tfadali. If, if you can speak fluent Arabic and you know what you want to study, then you can go to Mauritania. If you do not know what you want to study, if you are not fluent in the Arabic language, then I do not suggest for you to go to Mauritania. The people that go to Mauritania from the surrounding countries and from the faraway countries always send their best Arabic speakers so that they can become experts once they go there. If you're not an expert, yeah, no, I'm telling you, honey, I'm If you're not an expert in the Arabic language, or not an expert, I should say, if you're not good in the Arabic language, then you shouldn't go there because it's still going to take you two years or three years to master the Arabic language. But if you're good when you go there, it'll take you a year to master the Arabic language. Okay, it'll take you a year. And when we talk about master, we're not talking about just learning how to speak. We're talking about mastering the sciences, the 13 sciences. And that's if you're good going there to master them. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. I don't know what else I can tell, talk to people about with regards to Mauritania. And next one? The fault? Mother to the Takuli. Aywa. Now, can I call it? Been, uh, like my daughter said, <laughs> she said, if you lose your horses, or if you lose your 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 goats, or if you use your lose your camels, they're not going to return. It's not like you have a police force or you have a lost and found. If your animals get lost, they're lost. It's your responsibility. You have to go find your animal. And you're a criminal if you don't go. I remember one time I wanted to go to the city. I had prepared to go to the city. And I was on my way to go to the city. And one of my goats, my goat, my milk goat, got lost. She went with another herd of goats. Sometimes the goats want to go with somebody else's goat. I don't understand it, but that's what happens. And I said, well, forget her. She left with them. She'll come back when they come back. Whenever that is. I mean, there, were, there must have been tree-hugging hippies out there <laughs> standing in front of the car telling me, you cannot go till your goat gets back. And I could not go until the goat came back. And that's just, you know, it may sound silly. It may have nothing to do with what you may think is the Talib al-Ilm, but one of the benefits that you learn from this is that every one of the prophets was a shepherd of goats and sheep. And they say this was to teach the Prophet ﷺ how to be responsible over a herd of people who are not necessarily to be blamed when they go astray. You cannot blame the sheep when it goes astray. Likewise, if you deal with camels, camels are a little bit different. Camels are arrogant. Camels are rough. They'll spit on you. They'll walk away from you. You have to, you know, grab them by their tail sometimes. You have to keep them from drinking your own soapy water and they're going to get sick. They're going to think they know the direction and they'll take their daughters or their sons and they'll walk away for a long time and come back with rabies. You know, and, and it's all your fault. You know, so dealing with the camels, you learn how to deal with New Yorkers or Americans, you know, because they're very arrogant. They think they know everything and they only lead themselves and their children astray and they still don't want to listen to you. And that mushkila, no. So what do you do tell them? Fadl. So the point I want to make here is that going to Mauritania, la, 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 idha bana ba'id, la tal abu hadhi ashia. The point I want to make about more than ten, eh,
اوكي اجيبيها اجيبيها اينها اعطيني ايوه اجيب اجيبي وكل انا انا في I'm making a video. I'll call you back later, inshallah. Hold her. I'll click her. Okay. Uh, Kemal, cool. what, like I was saying, when you're dealing with the Mauritanians or you're dealing with Talib al in, in Mauritania, the same type of normal, mon la, la, the, the, the same type of mundane, moment to moment things that happen in people's lives or in the teacher's life. You're going to go through those same things with them. You could be in the middle of a lesson and a whole bunch of visitors come. And then you turn into a servant, serving them water or cutting up a watermelon or giving them dates or whatever it is to facilitate the visit of the people. He may get a phone call. Well, not in Mauritania. When I was there, they didn't have the cell phones. So the sheikh never had a cell phone. But now they have cell phones in Mauritania. So you probably have to deal with somebody getting on the cell phone and everything like that. I don't know what else to answer about now. Nah, Naam. In Mauritania, Jazakallah khair. If you're reading Quran anywhere in Mauritania, on the bus, or, which is just a van, or in the car, or in the store, if you make a mistake, everybody will stop and stare at you and say, no, you made a mistake, and they will start correcting you and everything like that. Be prepared for this type of thing. This is a good thing, actually. Be prepared for it. And sometimes, if you're reciting in Hafs and Asim, they won't understand it. They'll say, no, this is a mistake. You messed up the Qur'an because most of the people only know warsh. So even if you show them, say, no, it's, it's from the Qur'an, they'll take a pencil and they'll correct it. Say, no, maybe somebody make a printing mistake and they'll correct them the Qur'an like that because the people are very old-fashioned. They only know what they've been taught. They trust the teacher more than they trust any book. So if they didn't hear it from a teacher, they don't care what book you have it written in. They're going to go through that. And like I said, when, one of the other things that you need to know about Mauritania from a practical sense, it doesn't cost a whole bunch of money, but it does cost a whole bunch of heart. It does take a lot of energy from your wife, um, brothers who plan on going there and taking your wife and your children. You have to be very careful that you know what you're doing and that you don't put your family into a situation that they can't necessarily handle. Okay? So... This is what I want you all to know and understand about Mauritania. Not everybody can do it. The things that you do study in Mauritania are very practical, are very simple things. Um, the sheikh, astaghfirullah al the sheikhs out there, they don't care who you know or where you came from. They want to know if you've gone through the basics. If you've gone through a basic book, they will test you. They will check that jaw. They will not allow you to say that you know something and you actually don't know it. When you finish, you will not be a sheikh, but you will be uh, knowledgeable about the practical, the, the usul, the, the fundamental basic books. Al-Ajrumiya, Lamiya al Af'al, Bayquniya, the different fun, fun, fundamental books, that's what you'll know in Mauritania. And after that, I don't know what else to say. Now my daughter has more questions. Tafadali. Zikri Ali, when people need to use the bathroom. Naam. Turidini na kula hada? Aywa, skuti anti. La da tatakalami wa hiya tatakalam. Aywa. Tafadali. Okay. She was saying that, you know, it may be some things you're not accustomed to in Mauritania that the people do. That's normal. Bathrooms is a Western uh, thing. So when people have to use the bathroom, like she said, there is no such thing as street in Mauritania. When you live in the Sahara, it is exactly that, the desert. So there's, you cut a tent, a hole in the back of your tent, and you, the ladies go out to the back side of the tent. If you're not in that, in your type of village like that, some people may just stop wherever they are and use the bathroom right then and there. Okay? And you have to pretend like you don't see them. You know, that's what we used to do. We used to pretend that we didn't see them. And like Maimuna said, then they'll cover it up like cats and keep going. The best thing to do is not to cover it up. That's what we always say. Do not cover it up so that people can see it. And when they see it, it'll dry up real fast and no one will step into it. And when it dries up, it's no longer nudges. Okay, when it dry and the sun will make it bake it real fast. So within a few hours, it is, it'll be gone. You know, and then they have these beetles that come out from the ground too that'll take the, the dung and, and 
do away with it. So, and you know you're not too out there, you live from the sunnah, you will not make the, the you'll make, use the bathroom in the shade, because people use the shade. And it's very important because out there there's very little shade. So you see the importance, you see the importance of, of not using the bathroom, urinating or defecating in the shade. Because that's the only place that people have to, to hide when the sun gets very hot. Yani hind, aish, kida. So, naam. Qaylula. Naam. In Mauritania, you will take a nap every day. This is from the rules of living in the desert. Unless you'll get you know, cataracts and glaucoma in your eyes, your eyes will burn out. You cannot keep your eyes open during the middle of the day while you're living in Mauritania. The Qaylula, the, the midday, noon nap, or a little bit before noon, a little bit afternoon, before Asr, go to sleep. Everybody goes to sleep. One time, I had a, um, there was a slave. No, that wasn't. Not. One time, I sent the children to go to get some water from a well that was close by, and it was in the high part of the day, the high part of the sun. So, so somebody came to my tent and told me that the sheikh wanted me. So the sheikh made me come. I came over to his tent, and he said, "You go get the water." And then come back. I went and got the water. I came back to his tent. He said, we don't even make the slaves go and get the water during a hot part of the day. And I noticed then that my children were in his tent. <laughs> the ones that I had sent to go get the water. So they were relaxing in the shade, watching me go running back and forth, getting the water. And they were laughing at me. And the sheikh was protecting them. And that's the way it is in Mauritania. You know? And then sometimes, if they hear, the sheikh hear you yelling in your tent, He'll come, he won't come here when he sees you next time. He'll tell you don't yell at his children. Somebody from Qatar came to visit me while we were in Mauritania and he tried to take pictures. And it made a big problem, you know, because he said you cannot take pictures uh, here in this village, you know. And he said, well, I was only taking pictures of Abu Tawba's children. He says, Abu Tawba don't have no children here. These are all my children. If, you, if Abu Tawba had any children that he wanted to make pictures from, he would have taken them to some other village. Because here in my village, none of the children take pictures. So you have to respect the people's, their honor. Another thing we did when we were in Mauritania, we didn't go to the city without the sheikh's permission. This may be, some people may not accustomed to this. Maria, Maria. Some of the, the people say, well, I'm a grown man. I ain't nobody telling me what to do. Don't go to Mauritania if you're not ready for this type of discipline. Because it's, you, you can go and don't ask the sheikh, but it's disrespect. He may never say anything to you about it. But it shows your own character. It shows where you at or where you're not. Okay? Another thing people do, so, so we used to ask permission. It's th then we used to ask permission for the sheikh to go into the city. And sometimes he would question us and say, well, what are you going to the city for? No, I don't think that's a good idea. And that's his way of saying don't go. Not right now. And you don't know why he's saying that. But this is what the sheikh used to do at different times. And one of the things my wife is telling me to remind people, when we were there, there wasn't one night that the people didn't feed us. We lived in Mauritania, and I, I kept going back and forth to Mauritania for six years. Now, there was not one night, I said, that the people did not feed us lunch and dinner. That's how honorable they are, and that's how they treat their, their, their guests. No, they didn't give us breakfast. And no, sometimes the food wasn't enough for my size family. Sometimes the people, other people there didn't like the type of food, but it was their food. The food they fed their mothers, the same food they fed their children, is the same food they fed us. They would send us a cup or half a cup of milk that they used before we had our own animals to milk. They would send us half a cup and wait for the cup. And that was kind of strange. They, not that they, we thought they wanted to see us drink it. You know, but they needed their cup back because they only had one cup. So you have to understand that you're dealing with a different type of people. And I haven't been to Mauritania in the last two years, but it might have changed, but I don't think so. Certain things don't change that quickly with the people, even though now they have the Internet, even though now they have cell phones. They're still probably the best read people on the planet. OK, now. Um. I just want to remind the people that um, even though Americans are to themselves and they feel necessarily like visitors all the time, one of the traditions.
traditions in Mauritania is that every afternoon they make sure the people make sure that they visit someone. Amen. So you may always have visitors, and, and, and they're not rude about it. They'll come and they'll stay for a while. They'll talk to you. But that's part of their tradition, and it's something that we should get used to. Okay, my wife is saying also that one of the things that happens in Mauritania is that the people visit. Mostly she's talking about the ladies now. Okay, because the men don't do this. The reason why the men don't do this is because they see you in the masjid. Okay? Hey, Scotty. Naam. So the men see you in the masjid and they'll talk to you. And they'll deal with you in the masjid. They'll walk with you even towards your tent or they'll walk with you towards your house. After they get certain distance, they won't come any closer, okay? But the ladies will come in the afternoons and different things like that. لَيْسَ لَكِ هَذَا تَوَقَّفِيهَا يعني, They'll come and they'll visit, and most Americans, as she's saying, are very private about their personal business. There is no personal business in Mauritania. Everything is, is, is to be seen. All your business is right in front of everybody else. They'll come in and they'll ask you the most personal things. They'll look. Anything that sees is like the old police thing. Anything in sight is fair game. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So you leave. Even if you put your trash out, they're in. Right. They will go through your trash. They will go through your sewer. I remember <laughs> that some, we lost something in the sewer or dropped something in the sewer. And the very next day, somebody was like, man, you know, you threw this in the trash. This is very good. It was a pan or something like uh, they found it. I was like, where did you get that from? Alhamdulillah. We learned not to ask anymore because they got their ways of doing things. And they'll go through your trash because it's the old Missourian rule. Don't pass by the trash too fast. What may be trash to you may be something beneficial to them. And so you shouldn't turn your nose up to them. And if you're that type of individual, don't go to Mauritania. Because Mauritania, again, it's about the quality. They don't care what you think. They have no riyah in that regard. Okay? They are strictly about what you got between your ears. If you have, you have the most memorized person, then they will put you forward. They don't care what color you are. They don't care where you come from. They will put you forward. And that's the way they, they do it. We never had a problem about knowing who was the most knowledgeable amongst us after the shiuch. You know, because everybody knew his place. And even the sheikh would let you know who's who. Sometimes some guy would come and sit in the front of the class and sit next to the sheikh. And when it was his turn, it wasn't even his turn. He's just sitting there. And so somebody would say, hey, ah, you know, move out the way. Let somebody through. And the sheikh would say, no, let him sit close so he can hear everything I, I say. And so the sheikh would further say, because when he hears, his listening is not like your listening. When he hears, he understands what I'm saying. And he's going to teach many more people after I'm gone. When you hear, you may not understand even what I'm coming from, and you may have to go to this person and ask him about it. So let him sit closer so that he can understand what I'm, and hear me clearly what I'm saying. And then we knew from that that this person was the best of us out of everybody else there. Then when the shiuch used to come from Saudi and from Mecca, and they would come, they would sit on the floor and wait their turn just like everybody else. And they didn't have a problem with this. And so when we come back and the people say, well, who is Sheikh Muhammad Salam Ud Abdul the Shinkiti? We know that they don't know. It's not that the Shiuch don't know. We know it's that those individuals are, are, are in a small, shallow, you know, pigeonholed world, and so they can only see but so far. The knowledge in the place like Mauritania is great, but you have to be prepared for it. Okay, there was this incident. She's talking about an incident that happened in Mauritania. We were in the desert, living in tents, and there was an uh, American man who came. Actually, he wasn't even from America. He's from Belize, South America. And he came, and other people, there's another problem that you have in these different camps. You have people, may Allah bless them, we think they're on good. Everybody's claiming to be Salafi. These people claim to be ultra Salaf. Okay? Like, they're like, there's a difference. There's a balance. You have to be balanced. If you're Salafi, you're balanced. You're not on an extreme. And these people would even consider other people who are Salafi not Salafi enough. You know, as, as if there's such a thing. These ignorant people, as the Sheikh said, if they opened up their own camp, no one would go visit them. So they have to set themselves up in some Sheikh's camp in order for themselves to be heard. And so they would set up lessons 
for other people who they felt was not befitting to go sit with the sheikh yet. It's not your place to do that. And it's not your place to go to somebody else. If you went all the way there, as the sheikh said, you went all the way over to a place to go find some knowledge, then you get there and you ask the people in front of the place to teach you? No. You go inside and ask the people who you came there to see to teach you. So these people were keeping some of the students away, teaching them Arabic and the three books from Medina and these type of little basic things. And so the sheikh said, what happened to those people that came here? How come I don't see them sitting in my lessons? So they were told that he asked me to go investigate. I go investigate and I asked them. They said, well, we can't sit with the sheikh because we don't know Arabic. And, you know, we got to learn from these brothers first. So I asked them, who told you that? Who gave you this nasiha? This is what the brothers said, the brothers. Whenever you hear an isnad of they, them, the brothers, then it's a weak isnad. Give me a name. A name. In our deen, we name our men. That's part of the deen. And if you find someone who's claiming to be salaf and he doesn't give you any isnad, he tells you them. That's what they say. You know that he's telling you a lie. Okay? Or he's a coward. He doesn't want to name his men. The person that's on the sunnah, he names his men and he's not afraid. And he doesn't consider it causing a fitna by naming the people who told him that. The one who starts a fitna is the one who doesn't name the person. Or the one who goes around saying things in secret that doesn't, shouldn't be said and then doesn't want his name to be exposed. Okay? At any rate, when the, we found out that there was no particular name he was saying, I told the sheikh, the sheikh said no. It's my camp. The person wants to come study. Let them come and study from me. The person came. He studied directly from the sheikh. Just the verbs. Just regular basic Arabic. He learned from the sheikh. And it was a big deal for the sheikh and a great honor for the sheikh to introduce this person into the Arabic language. Because he's the sheikh. He knows how to introduce it to the person where it will be the most beneficial. So again... All the things that happens in Mauritania is like you lose a lot of your arrogance. You, you, you lose that. You don't become a Sufi. There's another misconception that I have to address that people say, Oh, I, don't, I heard there was a lot of Sufis in Mauritania. By Allah, Wallahi, Tallahi, Billahi alaykum. I swear by Allah, I have seen more Sufis and more severe Sufis in Egypt and in Morocco than I have ever seen anywhere else in the world. There is, there is some Sufis in Mauritania. The extent of it is that you hear them in their masajid, say, making some dua, and some of the dua they make is, is crazy, and some of the dua they make is exactly from the sunnah, but the way they do it is incorrect. So you hear them, or you see them after Fajr rolling out white um, sheets astaghfirullah and open it up and i don't know what else they do because i leave by that time if i find myself in a masjid when they start rolling out the rug i i get out of there quick that's the extent of it allah like i've never been in a masjid in mauritania or even heard of a masjid in mauritania where there was a grave never once Nowhere in Mauritania. I've traveled all over Mauritania, not every single place, but I lived there for a long time. Okay? I've been to, eat to, to Morocco. I couldn't hardly find a masjid in some places, in the cities, that they didn't have a grave in them. I've been to Egypt. There are sometimes in Tanta and other places, say the Bedoui, and other places where they have five graves in one masjid. And they have people paying money in lines of people making tawaf around the different graves. I've been there seeing Sufis rolling down the street, literally cartwheeling down the street and with flutes and singing and rolling and dancing as they go through the street like as a parade. This is in Egypt. So those people who say the hypocritical statement, I'm not going there because there's some Sufis there, they're liars. Because there's more Sufis in Egypt, there's more Sufis in and Morocco than there are anywhere in the more severe style. And anybody who says that they're Sufis, and they're talking about the people like uh, Sheikh Fahfu and, and, and Murabbit al-Hajj, and uh, what do you call it, the people that go with Hamza Yusuf, those people are so far away and so hated in most of the places in Mauritania, it is unbelievable. Yes, so Hamza Yusuf came to Mauritania, he never stayed. 
He took from his knowledge from the Mauritanians that were outside of the country and they brought him into the country and he visited time after time, spending a few months here, a few months there over the last 10, 15 years. He did that. He didn't come to Mauritania and sit there no number of years like the people are saying about him and he doesn't even claim that. Nor does he claim that you know, the ideas that he have are the general ideas of the Mauritanians. These are ideas of those people, those Ash'ari people that are out there in the, in, where he was at, at that plateau. I have to say, yes, prior to Sheikh uh, Muhammad, Abdullah, uh, Muhammad Amin Ash-Shinqiti, the majority of Mauritania were Ash'ari. Majority of the people were Ash'ari. Afterwards, after his da'wah, after him going to the Khalij and learning and then coming, not coming back, but sending back da'wah patrols to Mauritania, the majority of people in Mauritania are either Salafi or Ikhwani. There's a lot of Ikhwani there, there's some Ash'ari, and, but there's a lot of Salafi. A lot of Salafi. And you have those people, Tablighi Jama'ah. Tablighi, tab, what's it called? Jamata Tablik, yeah, Jamata Tablik, that's there too, and their style is, is, is funny style too, you know, they're more military over there, in fact, when there was a coup, they, they formed the ranks of the rebels that were fighting when there was a fight in Mauritania, I don't know if many people know about that, that part of Mauritania, and it didn't affect the people who were in the open desert, you know, we're safe because you're with the sheikh to avoid fitna. Halfi sheikh, naam. رضا نعم مثل عندي بنت ام كثوم نعم نعم تفضل رملة ام كثوم نعم ام كثوم let me just start with رملة my daughter رملة I think she breastfed off ten women out there or something like that when my daughter saying when you have a baby the women come and they want to share milk you know, and the baby will come, you know, get big. Be careful and make sure you know who is who. <coughs> so that later on, you don't try to marry your daughter off or your son off to someone who has become relative to him because you breastfed that child. And that may... Um, <laughs> so... You need to find out who's breastfeeding from your child or who bre your child is breastfeeding from so you know not to mix the, uh, the marriage with them. And they like to breastfeed them if they like you because they, they say people in other places in the world teach their children al Arabiya, Arabic. Whereas over there, they breastfeed the child Arabiya. You know, they, 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 they give it to them. And when the people are singing, oh, what's that stupid song, rock by baby on the treetop, or, you know, and those type of things, they're saying, they start teaching the children these things very, very young. So it's in their DNA. You know, they know it very well. Okay? Healthy shay. Healthy shay, umayyub, and I call. Nah, may muna. Lima the lam tuti darsin, auntie. Tali, and to tell me in a business with Mauritania. To the dean? I will father. Mahu was an. No. She wants the people to know that, you know, in, when you're in the Sahara, when you're in the Sahara Desert, you have to recognize that it is the desert. And the wind comes very, very strong. Very, very strong. It's going to come like a tornado or sandstorm. And it's going to be like a wall. And this wall of sand is going to come. And if you don't hurry up and get out of there, you know, or get inside, it's going to cover you up. Okay? So if you know what direction, what I used to do when I get caught in a sandstorm, I cover up my whole face. I wrap my face up, you know, with, with a, a, my imama. I wrap my face up in my mouth and just try to get my nose so I can breathe. And I face the direction that I want to go when I'm finished. Or I don't face the 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 wind, the the the, the, the asifa, the, the sandstorm. And I try to remember which direction that I have to go because the scenery is going to change. Okay, the scenery is going to change and it's going to come up some feet. Okay, while you're out there, it's, it's really going to change like that. So you try to know which direction it is, and then you just sit down and you just try to. No, let it, let it line up and just try to keep the, the stuff out your eyes and out your nose so you can go. And then when you finish, just get up, 
dust off and go home. You know, and the only reason I was I get caught out there because I had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and I didn't have no choice. So I had to go out there and it just caught me. And, and that's what happened. Alhamdulillah. That's a weird way to end. Hopefully she has another question. Tafadali. <laughs>